The Dark Room with your hosts, Paul Salvatore and Jordan Randall. Today we're interviewing Dave Cat, uh, the idolater who's married to a doll, and I think has more than just one doll, but he's not married to all of them. He views them as his significant others. So, um, when did you begin to get involved with real dolls? Um, basically around 1998, my best friend Montali had, uh, I mean, she and I have known each other since 1980. We grew up like two or three houses from each other. Well, about three or four houses from each other in the same neighborhood. Uh, she had known that I always had a fascination with artificial people, everything artificial, specifically artificial women. And, um, she had a job that had internet access, which is a novel idea back in 1998. And uh, she had come across the Abyss Creations website. Abyss Creations is, of course, a company that makes real dolls. And uh, she had phoned me and was like, Dave Cat, you've got to come down with me to work one day after work is done and come out and check this website out. This is something that's totally up your alley. You have to see this. So um, we went after hours back when you could, you know, check not safe for work websites right. at work. And uh, she showed me the, the website and I was just like, this is, uh, this is fantastic. This is amazing. And uh, then of course I saw the price and I was like, Oh my God, $5,000. Right. That's like the price of a used car. That's mental. How can anyone right. afford this sort of thing? But um, it, I was completely blown away at how realistic they were, how, and we'll see, that's the thing. I mean, real dolls and pretty much most dolls for most manufacturers inhabit this weird world of like realism and yet simultaneously n not realistic. But, you know, since I, I do have a fascination with artifice, as I'd said, I mean, that was absolutely perfect for me. Mm -hmm. So at that point, did you know that you were going to become, I guess, romantically involved with dolls? Or was this something still of a fascination? <laughs> Yeah, it was more of a fascination because, I mean, all told, I mean, like I said, it, I was blown away and completely amazed by seeing the Abyss Creations website. And I was just like, this is something I really want. I don't know if I can afford something like this, but this is something I've been wanting for years. And over the course of like a year and a half, I did actually save up to get my wife, Shidore. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I think at the outset, I was thinking of it in the context – I mean, at the outset, when Montali first showed me the site, I'd say 50% of it was, well, this will be something I can use to get rid of my loneliness. And uh, the other 50% was like, this can be something I can have fantastic sexual adventures with. Mm -hmm. And um, when Shichan first entered my life, it was a relationship that was, I'd say, 80% sexual based and 20% companionship based. But, you know, like any good relationship, it the, the dynamic shifted where it was, it was, I mean, at some point, I can't even remember where it was, but like at some point it went to mostly being sex-based and then the rest was companionship to now where it's mostly companionship with some sex. And well, we, we still are intimate with each other, but I mean, I think the main thing is that we're, we're a couple because of the love that we have for each other. It's, it's a relationship. It's not a traditional relationship, but it is a relationship. Right. Now, um, are you romantically attracted to human beings as well? I am. Well, see, I, I refer to like organics. Organics is a term you're going to hear a lot from. Yes, I'm glad you brought yeah. that up, Dave, because I, uh, I'm always trying to get the right words down because I know it's not just um, a doll. Uh, this, is a, this is your companion. So, I, yeah, if you could just, you know... Uh, yeah, I'll tell go us over what the, the right the right words are. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Uh because yeah. yeah, it's unfamiliar country, really. Mm -hmm. um, organics are basically any human being that are like ourselves, that are flesh and blood. You know, born from a mother. You know, I, 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 the, the rest should really be self-explanatory. Uh, synthetics is uh, a catch-all term that describes artificial humans, whether they're inanimate body dolls or gynoids, which would be female. Mm -hmm robots or right. androids which would be male robots or rather robots that are designed to look like men or women i mm -hmm. should say uh so good lord what was your original question so, yeah, yeah am uh, i still attracted to organics right. Right. yeah there you go yeah uh, i am i am still very much attracted to organic women but the thing is it's i i'm not actively pursuing a relationship with an organic woman and i haven't been for years um 
it's it's gotten to a point where it's just like I I for one I I have two lovely synthetic women at home for me that I know will always be there for me. And uh, the other factor is that it's just, you know, so much can go wrong in a relationship with an organic woman, which has actually happened on a couple of occasions with me where it's just like, you know, I ask myself, I have asked myself, well, is it, is it worth the pursuit? And nine times out of 10, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, you know, organic women are great. They're fantastic, you know, but as far as like being in a romantic relationship with one, I don't see that really ever happening, and which is perfectly fine because, again, you know, it's not something I'm pursuing. Right. Um, you know, when you're on reality shows and things like that, Strange Addiction, do you find that troublesome to have your relationship framed in that way? Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, I'll tell you this. It's like as far as like the My Strange Addiction uh, episodes that we were in, it was just like, well, for one, we don't watch broadcast television here at, at our flat, which I call deafening silence plus, because I believe every good home should have a name. Uh, we don't really watch broadcast television because a lot of television is just not that good as far as we're concerned. Mm -hmm. And when TLC approached us to be on my strange addiction, of course it was in the context of like, Oh yeah, TLC, blah, blah, blah. would like to know if you would like to be on a television show. And since I haven't really watched broadcast television in years, I'm like thinking, oh, TLC, the learning channel. Yeah, they're reputable. Yeah, they do a lot of like informative, educational type stuff. And then I told my mates about it and they were just like, yeah, Dave Cat, you don't really watch TV. So you don't really know what TLC really traffics in. It's like all ice road truckers and, you know, my adult baby or whatever sensationalist show that they've got. So I was just like, ah, right, fair enough. So being on a show that's right there in the title, My Strange Addiction, mm-hmm. I'm going, right, okay, this isn't an addiction. It's For one, it's a relationship. Right. It's an addiction in as much that you could say that you're addicted to – if you're in a relationship – if you're an organic person in a relationship with another organic person, you're addicted to your spouse. It doesn't make any sense in the context. Our relationship doesn't make any sense in the context of that title. I mean obviously we did the episodes. I mean – only because it was just like, well, you know, it is getting the idea of the synthetic option out there so that people know that this is something that is, well, an option that they could pursue if they are tired of being lonely and they like technology. But is it an addiction? No, it is not an addiction. It's not as if I can't leave my house with Shichan or Lenochka. It's not as if I'm like, you know, going through withdrawals because I don't have my dolls. It's it's misleading. Right, right. So you're, how many dolls do you have? Um, currently... Currently, I have two. Technically, I have three. Uh, there's Shidore Kuroneko, who is my wife. She is a real doll made by Abyss Creations. There is Elena Vostrakova, who is a doll made by a Russian company called Anatomical Doll. And she is the mistress that uh, Shichan and I share. And um, there's a third doll that we have uh, named Muriel Noonan, who is made by a, a Latvian company called Textile Doll. And... Um, uh, we, uh, uh, Shidori entered my life in 2000. Elena showed up in 2012. Muriel showed up in 2014. Muriel is, um, we like her, but I don't think she's really fitting in. So more than likely she is not going to be around for another year with us. We are going to find someone else who will adopt her. In, in what way do you mean that she's not fitting in? Um, well, for one, her construction is – it's unusual. I mean, as as per the name Textile Doll, she's not actually made of silicone like Shidore or Elena are. Uh, she's actually – it's like cotton – like, okay, there's a wooden skeleton, articulated wooden skeleton. Over that, there's like cotton batting. Over that, there's like kind of a leathery kind of musculature, and then over that is lycra for skin. And it's just like, that's yeah, really interesting and whatnot. But the thing is, for one, she can't really bend at the hips. So she's always standing, which is great, but she can't sit down. It's, it's a little impersonal. Mm-hmm. And another, it's like Lycra, it just, I don't know, there's something about it. It just doesn't really do it for me as far as like the way it feels as compared to silicone. And um, I mean, between that and her limited posability, it's just, uh, well, the third thing really is that I'm just really having trouble coming up with a character and personality for her. And it's just like, I mean, instead of like 
Shidore and Elena, where they've got like, you know, a history, a backstory, likes, dislikes, that sort of thing. Uh, Muriel is just, I mean, she's from Coventry and she's fascinated with things that are like ruined. That's largely all I've been able to come up with her. So it's, it's, she doesn't have the, the intimacy of having a personality as Shidore and Elena do. So it's just, it's just not working. You know, I mean, that happens in traditional relationships. You know, sometimes you meet someone and it just doesn't work out. Absolutely. I definitely know that. Um, <laughs> with, uh, with Shidore, um, Excellent. Excellent. You actually managed to pronounce her name properly. Uh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, so, so you guys are married and yes, so did, you, did you have a wedding? We didn't really have a wedding. She and I, uh, you know how it is with like some couples where they're just like together for like, oh yeah, we've been together for nine years and you know, we just got married or whatever. And they just kind of downplay the marriage aspect. We just haven't gotten around to actually like doing an actual ceremony. Um, We've been together, as a matter of fact, this year is our 15th anniversary, and um, we just didn't get around to it. It was between the fact that I just gotten a new job, and it was just like a whole bunch of stuff going around. It was just we didn't have the chance to plan. We were planning something big for the 20th or the 23rd, one or the other. Uh, the closest thing we would have gotten to like an actual ceremony is uh, the second time – it was one of, the, one of the times that TLC had come around. Uh, they said, oh, you want to do something as far as like a ceremony or whatever? And I was like, yeah. Um, what I have in mind is to actually have Shidore blessed by a Shinto priest. Um, one of the main uh, tenets of Shintoism, which is, of course, one of the main philosophies slash religions of Japan, is that they believe that anything, whether it's animate or inanimate, has a soul or a spirit of its own. Now... I'm 99.9% .9 atheist, but I think that whole idea of like everything having a spirit is is really fascinating because it basically means if you've got your head on straight, you're treating everything with respect, mm -hmm. you know, which is something that is, as far as I'm concerned, is not wrong at all. So, yeah, a Shinto priest will bless pretty much anything as far as like, you know, they've done ships, planes. There's actually like um, a couple of doll companies in Japan that actually have their dolls like consecrated in Shinto as ceremonies. So I was like, well, yeah, if you can get like a Shintoist priest to like bless the missus, that would be fantastic. Turns out they couldn't get one in time. So, oh. yeah. So these synthetics that you have, are they all manufactured for the purposes that you're using them for? It, technically, yes. Technically, yes. See, a lot of the companies will say, yes, they're sex dolls. And this is why I and my wife and our mistress are kind of like doing our little three person crusade to like say that, you know, Sure, they're dolls. I don't ever refer to my dolls as sex dolls because that's limiting. You know, yes, you can have sex with the dolls. However, you can also do a lot more with the dolls. There's people I know personally, other idolaters, that actually do not have sex with their dolls at all. They just have them as a comforting presence at, at home, someone to sleep with. Um, some people exclusively just take photos of their dolls and do nothing else with them, at least as far as we know. Um uh, as a matter of fact, an idolater that I knew personally who actually passed away a couple of years ago, um, he did have an intimate relationship with his doll, but he had her more as an artistic muse. He was actually writing a book, this really extensive book, and um, his doll Lily was like the main character in the book. And basically like his doll was the personification of the main character that he was writing. So, yeah, yes, you can – you know, make love to dolls, but that's just the tip of the iceberg, really. Right. It's not just limited to that. Exactly. Fantastic. Right. So, Dave, um, I guess maybe this should have been one of the first questions, but regarding the physicality of the doll, what does it feel like? Um, well, I could tell you Shidore is very – she has a definite physical presence. All dolls – I mean, we always say it's one thing to see photos of a doll, but it's another thing to meet one – in the flesh. Um, Shi Chan's third body, which she currently has, is 80 pounds. Her first two bodies were just under 100 pounds. I want to say like closer to 90, 95, that sort of thing. Uh, Elena clocks in at just under 60 pounds. With the different manufacturers, the different body styles, body types that they have, they all have varying weights. But um, it's, it's funny when you get a person that comes around to a place that there is a doll 
and they're just not used to a doll being there and it's just like you know that person will forget that she's there and it's just like oh god yeah god that's weird you know mm-hmm. there's just that they they have definite physical presences which is it's fantastic i mean that it leads heavily to the verisimilitude i can never say that word first time around uh that dolls have and it it helps make them real people in their own right very interesting right so i mean that's perfect segue into this question which is i mean uh, just talking to you dave cat um it seems quite clear to me that um you've got a very good understanding of what um your companions are feeling thinking um and when so that might from you know um an external point of view that might confuse some so how um how does that work exactly like are you um projecting or are you creating narratives or how does that how does that work out that's that's, you pretty much like hit the nail on the head with the second half it it's a narrative it's i mean dolls for me exist in two worlds i mean it's they know it i know it everyone that knows us knows it i mean there's you know the history that Shidore and Elena have where, you know, Shidore is half Japanese. Well, she's born of a Japanese father and an English mother and uh, lived in Japan for a bit and then lived in England for a long time. And that's where she grew up and blah, blah, blah. And then came and met me at a goth club in in 2000. And, you know, Elena Mm -hmm. grew up in Vladivostok. She had like a miserable childhood, Um, saw Shidore and I on a documentary and decided that she had to live with us because of the way that she saw how much affection that I had for Shidore. So uh, she hopped a plane and uh, moved in with us. That so is, there's... Yeah. You know, yeah. That, that is so interesting. There's so, those narratives. But... Right. They also realize, and I also realize that, yeah, they're made in factories. They're made in factories or in studios and, you know, put together. They're 100% silicone except for the foam bits and the, you know, steel joints and the PVC pipes for the bones and, uh, you know, shipped in crates. You know, they're people and they're dolls. So it's not a case of me, as as some people would say, it's not a case of me thinking that my dolls are real people. It's – I give them personalities because they have a very human presence. There is a very physical, as we just discussed, presence. They exist, Mm -hmm. you know. However, I don't think of them as actually doing something like, oh, well, okay, she chan's probably getting up around this time out of bed and updating her Twitter feed, you know. Right. She doesn't actually do that. She's a doll, right. you know. But there is a narrative involved, which, again, lends them a personality and, you know, again, fleshes them out, as it were, as people. You know, it's it's an ongoing live-action fiction, I guess you could say, sure. for lack of a better term. So, really, no, I think that kind of creativity is fascinating and uh any idea um what influences your choices of what kinds of narratives you make a large part well some parts eh, there you can trace direct elements of uh all the dolls that i have in my life to like certain things that i like or certain things that i'm into um I've always been fascinated with Japan and England, and that's why my wife is half Japanese, half English. Um, I've always been interested in the space program, which is why Elena has a huge interest in um, the Soviet era space program. Uh, there's like various bits and bobs that like I draw from my own life and like try to expand on with um, their lives, because you know, for one, you you go with what you know as as a creative as a creative basically mm-hmm. and um it, it's it's kind of fun to expand on that because it just again it just gives them a presence but you know it, things that i've had in my life things that i've experienced things that i've met people that i've met and just all that like you know gets like kind of taken from a block of raw material and just kind of shaved down into whatever goes into their personalities right i imagine this could be a possible misconception um but uh, which is, well, let me first mention the misconception um, that um, having dolls isolates you from other organics. But I was thinking, has it potentially drawn you closer to that? I mean, have they been things that have made you more friends with organics? Definitely, definitely. Um, I can tell you this without reserve that uh, I... I am more confident, I would say, in meeting people 
now that Shidore and Elena and everyone else is in my life than I was before. For one, there's the the dating aspect. I mean, before I was like, you know, I wouldn't say close to desperation, but I was just like really annoyed that I didn't have a girlfriend. And it was just like, oh God, when when is the right girl coming along? What is this? Why why can't I find someone? Uh, you know, and it was just that stress and that, you know, tension and that pursuit and that, you know, find someone and then like uh, it didn't go the way it should. Mm-hmm. And then have that like, you know, that depression for a while. And then, of course, you know, everyone says, oh, you got to get back on the horse. And at some point you you ask yourself, well, is it really worth getting back on the horse? You know, right. But with Shidore, it's just like, well, you know, I don't have a horse. I have a Vespa. Okay. It's a horrible analogy, but still. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but as far as like, you know, non-romantic context, it's just like, I mean, I've got a group of friends that I've been hanging around since with pretty much every weekend for the past, I want to say almost 20 years, you know, in our own way, we're all geeks, you know, we're all into like comic books and manga and anime and video games and like seeing films and like playing yeah, just the usual geek tropes, I guess you could say. I hate using that term geek. I hate using a term trope for that matter, but you know, <laughs> things of that nature. But as far as like, you know, other people, it's, it's a point of pride almost for me to say, you know what? Yeah, this is, this is what Shirore has brought to my life. I've been able to meet loads of people because of her, like, you know, all the other idolaters that I know, all the other media individuals such as yourself that I now know because of her, you know, right. um, I, because of my interest in dolls, I've, gone to california for the first time back in 2001 and have been going like every couple of years for like you know doll related convention type things i'd gone to new york two years ago for the first time to work with a fellow idolater who's a a performance artist you know the uh, not to mention all the idolaters and other people i've met like in other countries england japan germany france you know it's i would not have met the people or seen the things or gone to the places i've been without shidore in my life and you know if if i'm not in any way thankful that would be foolish right i mean speaking of other idolaters um i think i mentioned to you when i went to new york to the museum of sex there was um, a real doll of a man and a real doll of a woman. So are these other idolaters you're meeting, are they exclusively men or are they men and women? 99% of idolaters pretty much in the global community mm-hmm. are male, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate but expected but unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you this. It's like, yeah, like I said, 99% are male and then there's a subsection who are female and then there's an even small subsection of those. No, I'll tell you this. 99% are male with female dolls. And then you've got females with female dolls. And then you've got males with male dolls. And then the tiniest subsection of all would be the females with the male dolls. Okay. I mean, I literally know like three organic females with male synthetics. Wow. And for one, there's practical reasons for that. Male dolls are heavier um they average out at about like 100 110 pounds that sort of thing right. which is a lot for anyone male or female to lift mm-hmm. you know and another i guess you could delve into the whole well men are more attracted to looks and women are more attracted to brains kind of thing i mean there's i guess credence to that statement but there's also you know it's it's 2015 it it doesn't always it's not it's not ironclad right. you know right. so it's like i said it is unfortunate that most idolaters are male i mean not that i have a problem with the fact that you know the idolaters that i know being male it's just that i wish there were more gender diversity in the idolater community Certainly. Yeah. so when you're going to conventions let's say or anywhere and traveling with any of your companions, like, do you, like, if you're going on a plane, like, do you get them a plane seat, or do you have to stow them in the? Overhead? That's the thing. We we uh, when we when we have our conventions or meetings and whatnot, we don't take our dolls oh, because okay. there's there's way too much hassle. There is, I'll tell you this. By and large, most idolaters that you'll run across don't really take their dolls with them. Um, there is an idolater couple that we know in Chicago, as a matter of fact, um, and, uh, Hans, not his real name, uh, will take B, not her real name to the zoo, like pretty much once a month. 
Uh, he's got a wheelchair for her. She, it's, it's, it's really charming because uh, she's got a membership to the zoo. As a matter of fact, she's got her little membership card. Um, they go to the zoo. They're regular at like this one specific, I think, Italian restaurant. You know, I don't know if they have their own table, but like pretty much people know them. They've been out and about and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there's that. He's not on the Internet. Well, he's not voluntarily on the Internet because you know how the Internet is. Uh, but the thing is, it's like he kind of considers himself to like be a uh, promoter of idolater culture by the simple fact that he and his doll wife actually will go out and about and like, you know, say, hey, you know, we're we're just people. One of us is, just happens to be synthetic. Um but the practical reason a lot of idolaters don't do things like that is that it there is wear and tear that takes place on a doll. Um, B, as a matter of fact, I want to say she was made in 2003. I can't remember. I keep forgetting this. and I'm lousy about this. Uh, you don't remember, do you? I mean, she doesn't remember. Uh, <laughs> um, but – B was made more or less in 2003, and she's pretty much falling apart at this point because of all the wear and tear of, like, lifting her out of the car into the seat, driving around with her. You know, it's – it's there's a practical aspect to it. I mean we always say that, like, dolls are simultaneously fragile and robust at the same time. So it's like they're built to withstand some stresses, but it's just, like, not a lot of stress, not over and over and over again. And it's just, like it, – it's – so, I mean, and then plus, of course, the social stigma is like, yeah, well, you know, we're, we're just out with our dolls. What's the problem? You know, but people don't think like that, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we just get together and we just show pictures of our, our synthetic women. That's fascinating. So when there is wear and tear, like how, how do you go about repairing that? I mean, some of us have a little more technical know-how than others, let's just say. Um, I know a guy. <laughs> um in one of the documentaries that we were in, uh, I want to say it was Guys and Dolls, and that was mm -hmm. back in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, Shidore's second body had gotten to the point where her, her joints were pretty much almost all loose. And um, when you have a doll that has tight joints, she's able to, like, you know, hold her limbs in certain positions and whatnot. But if they're loose, it's, it's just no going. So um, the filmmakers had arranged to actually fly her out to a doll doctor – uh, in Southern California, and you know she got repaired. That's pretty much the basis of our segment, guys and dolls. Um, he has since retired, but I was being serious when I said I know a guy. There's a fellow idolater that I know, like several states away, and he's pretty much in Michigan periodically because we all get together for what we call doll co doll congresses. You know, much like a real congress, we get together and like just sit around and do nothing but eat. <laughs> you and uh you know if he if he remembers or if like one of us says oh well could you come and look at monica she needs her neck tightened he'll like uh -huh. you know bring this like giant thing of tools and like you know oh, really? so wow so actually uh Vivka, you reminded me i think in that documentary there was a gentleman who was also involved with organics uh and was also involved with dolls i believe i mean there was one scene if i'm correct where he brings an organic woman home to see yes. what she thinks about the doll so um i um i'm wondering whether you ever wonder if that's a possibility for you where you get involved with an organic woman in a long-term relationship without necessarily um ending the relationships with uh, your companions um well, I'll tell you this. It's I would be hard pressed to say that there would be any organic woman that would not already know me from the documentaries and tele segments that we've done. Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, within the past, like I want to say, two or three years, I've actually met like a couple of organic classes online mm -hmm. that were romantically interested in me, and we actually had like a little online relationship <laughs> online relationship because it's online relationships and long distance relationships i guess work for a lot of people but they don't for me i need a physical aspect to my relationship to actually you know reassure me that it is a genuine thing mm -hmm. but we you know basically i i had met these women on on the basis that they'd seen me on television mm -hmm. you know so i mean and this had happened i want to say like 
four times and it's just like oh yeah i saw you and your doll and such and such and it's just like yeah i think she's cute and i think you're cute and it's just like oh okay fair enough let's see how far this goes right. you know and it was just like you know if i were to ever actually like encounter an organic woman that like hadn't seen me on telly well for one kudos to her i suppose but it's just it would be weird but the thing is it's there would be no way i'd you know suddenly say right i have to hide my dolls i mean because she and elena are as much a part of my life as any other aspect of my life it wouldn't make any sense to me to hide them or conceal them or and then another thing too i'm like huge on not lying in relationships so if i like you know get into a relationship with an organic woman and say you know or not say that i had dolls that would be just lying because it's just like I, I again i wouldn't be hiding my dolls so um, i mean she'd have to be extremely open-minded really <laughs> yeah no so Dave, do you mind if i ask like what do you do um for a living well i actually work in, at a data at the data entry department for a healthcare firm the name dave cat <laughs> where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> that is a nickname i basically came up for myself back in 1987 um as i mentioned i i play a lot of video games not a huge amount compared to a lot of people these days but there was one video game back then back when you used to go to arcades to play video games um there's a side-scrolling shooter that took place in space called r-type you know it's basically you're piloting a spaceship and you're shooting aliens and um with most video games, you know, if you do very well with a high score, you get to add your initials in, you know, three letters. Our type had seven. So I, at one point, had gotten a really high enough score to actually put my name on the board. And I was just like, right, okay, so uh, D-A-V-E, um, uh, C-A-T. There we go, Dave Cat. And thus the legend slash horror was born. Wow. <laughs> it sticks, you know. It's It's convenient. I love cats. I think cats are like, you know the best animal on the face of the earth uh and plus it's it's both like a thing that make me stand out because like you know like morrissey or sting you have an eponymous name that like defines you it's like oh it's dave cat you know people instantly know who i am but it's also kind of a shield because you know obviously i i don't use my legal name for one i don't really like my legal name i don't like the way it sounds and it you know if i'm not using that then it's a lot better to use dave cat Short, punchy, to the point. It sounds cool. It sounds cool. Thank you. <laughs> you will not believe how many people misspell it, though. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I hope I've been spelling yeah, it right. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like, you know, I should have mentioned that. It's just like, it was also because my, my legal last name is, is spelt in a way where it's just like it's easy to mix up the spelling with something else. And it's just like, well, D-A-V-E-C-A-T is pretty straightforward. You know, you get people like putting a space in between the Dave and the cat. Mm -hmm people spelling it with a k and i'm just like what are you where are you coming up with right. shirore on the other hand could tell you stories about how many people have like screwed up her spelling of the name so we'll move on <laughs> so, so something that came into my mind as i'm sure it has most people um mm -hmm. when i heard about you and i did see the tlc thing is um the film lars and the real girl <laughs> yes so i mean when you, have you seen this film Oh yeah, yeah. There's a uh, copy on DVD right over there. Okay, and yes. how accurately do you feel that movie depicts someone in that sort of circumstance? It's, it is both accurate. I'll say this to start off with: it is probably one of the most sensitive approaches towards idolater living that I I'd, I'd seen, because prior to that, the only thing. No, actually, there are a couple of films. There is a, but prior to that, an American-made film. There was an American-made film called Love Object, and basically, you know, this loner guy at work like gets a doll to dispel his loneliness, and the doll comes to life and starts killing people. I'm just like, right, this is the entirely wrong message that needs to be sent out there. Yet, and still, I have a copy. Um, I should have stolen it. But um, <laughs> as far as Lars and the Real Girl is concerned, it's it it was a very sensitive portrayal of uh you know some of us who have dolls as companions and choose to live with dolls as companions uh it should be said though however that does not encompass every person who has a doll um which there's a spectrum obviously with any subculture um there are those we sometimes refer to as doll husbands 
you know, like the bloke in Chicago that I mentioned, uh, myself, a couple of others, you know, who treat our dolls like there are basically wives or husbands or whatever, you know. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's the doll fetishists. Um, the bloke that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Salvatore, uh, on um, Guys and Dolls, the one who had uh, tried to introduce right. that organic woman, he is probably the textbook definition of a doll fetishist. Um, okay. He just sees his dolls as expensive sex toys. He doesn't assign personalities to them. I don't even think they have surnames. You know, they're just mm -hmm. things he can have sex with. You know, um, and of course, there's a thousand different shades in between those two points. Lars, um, can't remember his surname, but you know, Lars of Lars and the Real Girl. He's obviously more towards my end of the spectrum. But the thing is, as quite a few people have pointed out to me, is just like, well. Lars is a really sweet guy, but he's a little kind of he's a little kind of nuts in his own way. I mean, there's there's a reason why he has imbalances because you know he had the incident where like um I, I can't remember it's been a while since we've seen the film, but I think his mother died in childbirth. His mother died giving birth to him or something along those lines. Um, so he is he has a fear of being touched. So there's that. And the thing is, a lot of people say, oh, you know, they'll just come away with like the baseline impression that like, well, only people who are slightly insane or slightly crazy or slightly odd or weird or whatever will have these dolls. And as I'd said in the post I'd written that reviewed Lars and Real Girl on my blog, shouting to hear the echoes, um, that Lars basically had his psychological issues long before Bianca entered his life. Not only that, Bianca actually helped him get rid of some of those issues. You know, as a matter of fact, the film ends with him like you know basically reaching out to the organic girl that he sort of has a crush on. Well, it definitely has a crush on him. I didn't like the ending. I should say that um, it was too Hollywoody because it's just like, oh yeah. I mean, I'll say this: Bianca served a definite purpose. Bianca served the purpose of helping Lars not be so reticent to contact and physically and mentally and emotionally other human beings but she bianca also served as a foil and technically as a tool where it's just like okay well bianca's helped lars get over the fear of like being physically touched and now we're going to kill her off you know mm -hmm. if shidori and i had written the script of course you know lars and bianca would end up living with each other happily ever after of course lars would be able to like be able to interact with more organics but he'd still have bianca as his wife but that's us writing the script, which is why we don't uh, release Hollywood films, I suppose. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, interesting, Dave Katz. So I'm wondering, I mean, um, is there a parallel with organic relationships that you have uh, in terms of uh, verbal interaction? Do you have um, any kinds of conversations or things that resemble that? And by the same token, do you ever, um, again, not assuming anything here. Um, do you argue uh, as organic traditional couples? couples. Oh, right, yeah. organic or traditional, right, yes. Yeah, yeah. So how um, does that work? It's, you know, the conversation that we have are, like, they're mostly, like, in, it's a mental thing. It's, I mean, I would like to believe that, like, you know, we do have some sort of connection, obviously. Again, the connection is entirely fabricated by me. I'm the one fabricating the relationship and everything else that is, non-physical with any of my dolls but it, it's gotten to the point where i mean when i say gotten to the point i mean maybe like a couple of months after she chan entered my life but it's it's you know there is i mean i speak to her every day i speak to elena every day i mean it doesn't make sense to not speak to and interact with you know two women that i consider like you know focal points in my life right you know um as far as arguments uh, we, we Shi Chan actually was asked this on her Tumblr, mm -hmm. and um, her answer is pretty much the same as mine. Is like uh, the last time we had an argument was so long ago we can't even remember what it was about. Okay. You know, we try to adhere to the "don't go to bed angry" policy, which every right. couple should you know adhere right. to. But um, it's usually just trivial stuff. I mean, no relationship can be a hundred percent perfect. If you have someone that's absolutely perfect, that is kind of dull, you mm -hmm. know. I think really the way the relationship that I have with Shidore especially – I mean this also happens with Elena as well, but not to the extent as it does with the misses because you know, there's more of a history there. Um, 
But like basically if you follow me or Shichan on Twitter, you're only getting half the story. Because there's like these little interplays that we'll do like, you know, like tweeting at each other. I mean, mm. not a lot because it doesn't make sense to tweet someone who's living with you. But it's just like, you know, there's like an interaction there. I guess a lot of the interaction that a lot of people can see that, you know, don't live with us um, would be seen online. And uh, a lot of people picked up on that. Or it's just like, yeah, you know, she's the smarter one of the duo, and <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which I will, I will readily cop to. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, it's like I said, you know, dolls have this this human presence, this physical existence that, you know, it's to to ignore something like that and not interact with something as as beautiful as a doll is is for one a disservice to the the person who'd made the doll. And another it's I mean, there's just like that that kind of dead zone in, I guess, one's own perception, you know, certainly. I mean, just as an aside, I thought you might be interested. I saw this great video today of a boy um, who was being urged on maybe by his mom or someone um, to uh, to hit the piñata. It was a piñata of, um, I think it was uh, Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. But eventually he just, he can't do it. He puts down the stick and he goes over. This boy must have been like maybe, I don't know, three, four years old. Then he goes, it was really touching. He goes over to the Spider-Man pinata and he, instead of hitting it anyway, just, he hugs it. Wow. So I was thinking that was so touchy, you know, and I was thinking I like maybe that. there's a part of us, you know, we cognitively, the human form, you know, we, we respond to it naturally with compassion. That is uh, exactly what it is. Yeah. Um, now <laughs> I'm very curious Dave, about, um, the trajectory of your relationships. Um, do they follow, the organic relationship in terms of like aging um, because you know um, organic couples are so used to if they're with each other long term um, with the idea of growing old together you know and seeing each other physically change yeah uh, but you know in your case uh, arguably not because I mean a, a doll doesn't you know um, physically. Get wrinkles <laughs> and things like that um, so yeah uh, how do you feel about that that one aspect of aging it's it, it has it has come up a couple of times. I mean, it's just like, I mean, Shi Chan has said she's she's in for the long haul. She's going to be sticking by my side, literally till death do us part. That sort of thing. Uh, I I have no intention of uh, divorcing her, as it were. But it's just like as far as like the physical aspects, it's it's funny. Um, I run across a photo of the missus and I, like from I want to say two thousand one. Mm-hmm. I'm like staring at this. It's like we both look so much younger back then, uh, you know. Yeah. I didn't have as much gray in my hair, and you know, five o'clock, whatever the hell this is supposed right. to be. What's going on with that? It's well, as I always like to say, it's my ideal partner would be a gynoid version of Shidori, of course, mm-hmm. like an actual robot version that could walk and talk and that sort of thing. So, you know, I guess when I get to my dotage, you know, she can like push me around in, in my hover wheelchair, right. my hover chair, you know, that sort mm-hmm. of thing. Um, but even then she's not going to, she's still going to look like she looks now, you know? Right. And it's just, someone else had pointed out to me because it, it, it had never occurred to me in like a thousand years. Someone else had pointed out to me that like through the fact that, you know, Shidore is obviously never going to physically change. It kind of gives her an immortality and it gives me an immortality in my own way as well. I mean, since, you know, the personality that I've created for her is something I've created, but in, in a way it's like, well, she's not going to die physically. Then, I mean, there are plans that we have yet to officially set up if we can actually get away with it as far as like what will happen when I die, if I die. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, they're kind of complicated and, you know, I don't want to go into them here. Sure. We're kind of hammering out the plants. All right. Okay. No problem. Um, now you kind of touched on it before, um, they've had now, I mean, you obviously seem, um, very comfortable and, uh, confident with, um, your relationships. Um, Despite that, do you still feel that people are trying to, quote unquote, fix the situation? There's always that person who's trying to set you up with an organic, you know, trying to be the person who, quote unquote, comes to save the day. I'll, you know, I'll make everything right here for Dave Cat. 
Yeah, that I mean that kind of occurred to some extent it occurs with my father. My father is like a hundred percent against the relationships that I have with Shichan and Lenka. Um he would much rather see me well, carrying on the family business for one, uh, which was being a landlord, even though he's retired. Um but he would rather see me with an organic woman with at least one child, you know, mm-hmm. all the sorts of things that like basically he had for himself. He had he had for himself and he had set out. Uh, he had his father set out for him, I should say. So there's that. There are, I'm sure, a few of my friends who are just like, yeah, you know, the relationship. I mean, most of my friends are pretty much they're like, you know, he's happy with Shidore. I see how happy he is with Shidore and Elena and whatnot. You know, mm-hmm. whatever floats his boat, that works. Right. But I'm sure there's a couple of friends who are just like, he's happy with his doll, but we could get him a girlfriend. Thankfully, they haven't tried to set me up like that because that mm-hmm. would be nightmarish. Right. And, but as far as like those, uh, the lasses that I mentioned with the online relationships prior to this, where it's just like, you know, they were saying, oh, you know, your doll's cute, Dave Cat, and she's really attractive, and you're really attractive too. But I think in the back of their minds, too, it's just like, I mean, it's been said like about a thousand times, especially in these documentaries. It's like, yeah, she, she chan is my wife. I consider her to be my wife. Right. You know, we've, we've got matching wedding bands that you mm-hmm. pretty much can't see. But, um, but you, you kind of get into the, I mean, as a matter of fact, I had told this to one of those women, like when I was like breaking up with her, breaking off the relationship. And it's just like, I don't know if you realize this, but it's like you're kind of driving yourself between us. I mean, you're not maybe doing it sub, you're not maybe consciously doing it, but you are subconsciously trying to wedge yourself and maybe supplant Shi Chan's position as being like, you know, the prime love interest. And it's just like, I mean, I, it, I'm interested, but I'm also afraid of what could go wrong. And with one of them, it did go horribly wrong. So I'm glad I didn't go any farther right but yeah i'm sure there's always going to be some individual out there is just like yeah your dolls are great but you know have you ever thought about having kids and it's just like yeah i don't i've never wanted kids so yeah i i, I thought about it and then i stopped thinking about it so you know it's funny I, i'm i'm like a huge horror buff and you know there's like these reoccurring like movies like chucky and like annabelle and stuff with dolls mm-hmm. and they're portrayed in this like sort of scary way and i gotta be honest with you like I, I am a little bit creeped out by that idea. Like I have like a like a big toy stuffed dog. It's not like taxidermy or anything, but it's just like a yeah. dog. And <laughs> like a big plushie. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like every now and again, like I'll go into my apartment and like you know, like like I swear I put it in a certain way and then it's like looking the other way and I'm like, like Oh dog. my god. Yeah, like it scares <laughs> me a little bit. Yeah. Like it's unfounded, I know, but like if that scenario were to happen to you, let's say, would that be something that you would be scared by or was that some is that something that you would be really happy about i'd be fantastic this is like well great i have absolutely no reason to leave the apartment now this is fantastic <laughs> it's i don't know it's the whole thing of like i mean you may be familiar possibly with the concept of the uncanny valley um there's a theory by a roboticist uh japanese roboticist named masahiro mori uh he had come up with this theory in the 70s called the uncanny valley and basically he, through this theory, I, I should say theory with air quotes because it's, you know, it's still a little unfounded. Um, he basically says that, like, the closer you have something that is inanimate, the closer in appearance and behavior that that inanimate thing gets towards acting or behaving or looking like something that is animate, like a human or an animal or whatever, there's like this dip where it becomes like it goes from realistic to realistic to the point where it's very weird. It's uncanny, you know. And so a lot of people like posit like say for instance the the film that came out, I think it was a Pixar film, I can't remember. It's called The Polar Express. And it was like done in like the early 2000s is a CG animated film. Mm-hmm. Tom Hanks is on the voice actors and like, you know, it was like basically I don't know what the hell the film was about. It was a train in the winter as far as i know <laughs> but uh they had designed the characters to be reasonably realistic but everyone was saying well i say everyone but like most people most detractors of the film were saying that like it was creepy because the characters looked realistic 
but they had like this like blankness this dead-eyed stare to like their appearance and whatnot and that's a, that's an that's one example of the uncanny valley the thing is it's like not everyone gets that reaction when they see something that's like something alive but isn't something alive you know i for instance i don't get that at all you know i've always been fascinated like i said with artifice i've always loved mannequins you know before um I knew about real dolls. I, I, I was really keen on mannequins. There used to be a mannequin studio downtown Detroit. I used to like take photos there like once a month. Um, but like I think a large part of it too is that you know there's exposure to it. I think a lot of the reason why people like just have a visceral reaction to uh, something that is not alive, basically a synthetic whatever, is because – Partially, they're not used to it, and partially because of peer pressure and peer reaction. Uh, there's so many films and television shows, as you said, that like you know, posit like you know, an artificial being is being, oh, oh, robots are going to enslave us all and whatnot, or you know, that doll's going to kill you if you turn around and whatnot. But I think if there are more things that didn't have that message of malevolence tied in with the artificial being, then less people would be like, this is something I should be afraid of, and rather being. Well, this is something that's okay. I mean, kind of going back to the whole Shintoism thing I'd said, uh, like I said, it's, it's a pillar of like Japanese history and culture and that sort of thing. Over in Japan, they basically – they're keen on robots and they're okay with dolls and they're fine with inanimate objects that are alive or whatever. They don't have as averse a reaction as we do in the West to that sort of thing where it's like, oh, this is an umbrella that's hopping around. Granted, an umbrella hopping around would be a little weird. However, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, they don't have the reaction of like, this is something that looks like a human and acts like a human, but is clearly not human. So obviously it's going to kill us. You know, that's the thing I don't understand why, if you're going to attribute something that looks, acts and behaves like a human, why would you attribute it with malicious intent? You know, why would you not say, well, this is something that can help me or something that can pick up my laundry or whatever. That's the thing I don't really understand. So I, I think a lot of it is, is it, a lot of it is exposure and a lot of it is popular culture. But then you also say a lot of it's philosophical, a huge part of it's philosophical. If something that is obviously artificial, you know, and fake or whatever has a soul or at least acts like a human, then what does that make actual organic humans? You know, when there's no definition that organic humans have a soul, right. you know, it, it, it throws into question what everyone who's dr grown up with the whole Judeo-Christian belief set into like just total chaos because they don't know what makes them special, what makes them human, what makes them unique. You know, and it's just like, well, you're unique in the way you live, not because of a thing that is ill-defined and can't really be proven, you know, but – that's neither here nor there, I suppose. Um, so my last question before Jordan um, is, Steve, is there anything you believe that um, real dolls can offer that without exception, uh, organics cannot? Mm. Yes. Consistency. Mm -hmm. 100% consistency. Um, consistency, uh, no deception, no lies. Um I mean, that's really the biggest three. I mean, that's the thing that gets me. It's just like, I mean, everyone over the course of the day, over the course of their existence, they're going to be telling fibs, lies, white lies, you know, that sort of thing that, you know, it basically is the social lubricant, essentially, you know, because if you're 100% honest, you'll end up getting stabbed in a bathtub or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um like uh, Solomon or Diocletian or whatever. I can't remember some Greek philosopher. Nevertheless, um, but the thing is, it's like you also want to avoid lying to people and you also want to avoid being lied to because uh, I guess the simplest way I can put this is that, you know, if you're an organic and you fall in love with another organic, you know, if things don't exactly work out the way they should at the beginning, Beginning at the outset, there's a chance that someone, either one or both of those people, are going to be presenting themselves in not a hundred percent honest light. They're going to be saying, maybe they'll like tell a story like, "Oh yeah, I I go kayaking all the time" because they know that person likes kayaking and that's what they want to hear. You know, so it's like 
one organic is actually not falling in love with the other organic. They're just falling in love with the idea that they have of that other person. Right. And at some point, that idea is going to disappear. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the two people are going to see themselves for who they actually are, and they could either go, all right, fair enough. This is who you are. I, all right, yeah, it still works. Or they're going to be like, wow, um, this is false advertising. Right, you know? right. With a doll, you don't get that. Um, granted, yes, there is obviously the deception factor because, you know, an idolater is deceiving themselves in the thinking. I mean, well, depending on what level of, you know, sentience and personality you're giving your doll, you're deceiving yourself into thinking that, yeah, she's a person. She's got her own likes, dislikes, et cetera, et cetera. But the thing is, you know you're doing it. You know, it's not as if someone is telling you a lie. You know you're telling yourself a lie, and it's just like, well, it's not really a lie. It's a fiction. It's a narrative. Mm-hmm. So synthetics, you know, will never have any of the negative qualities that you see in a lot of organics. Um, they're never going to operate on their own agenda and twist your emotions towards their own needs. You know, uh, they're never going to be critical just to cut you down and elevate themselves. You know, right. you never have to worry about them cheating on you. So, I mean, obviously that's not going to happen in every single like relationship with an organic, but it is, I understand divorce rates are pretty high these right. days. So, yes, I, mean, no, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because idea, I think what you're saying or what you're saying is that um, what they can offer is what ideally organics want or ultimately want in their own relationships. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like there is absolutely nothing wrong in wanting that. If you're an organic and you're in a a relationship with another organic, yeah, one of the prime things you want is someone that's never going to lie to you or cheat on you, all the things I mentioned. But the thing is, organics can't provide guarantees. Mm -hmm. Even with the best intention, no one can provide a guarantee. And even if you have that sort of point, you know, where, you know, one organic saying, okay, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to do what they say. I'm never going to lie. I'm never going to cheat. I'm never going to et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, human frailty always comes into play. And even with the best intentions, it's just like you're you're going to end up sublimating a part of yourself. And it's – any good relationship should have that compromise, that give and take. But the thing is you have to be careful that you don't lose so much of yourself just to make someone else happy, especially if there's not a guarantee that that other person is always going to be with you. You always hear those stories of like, oh, yeah, you know, she and I were doing great and whatnot, but, you know, she asked me to, like, stop hanging out with the guys so much and that sort of thing. And so I haven't seen my friends that I've been friends with for the past, like, two decades, and, you know, I see them, like, once, like, maybe every six months now, but, you know, that's what she wants. Mm -hmm. And then you've just destroyed another couple of relationships with your longtime friends just to, like, make your, your partner happy. And then, you know... That's again, that's that's ripping something out of your life that's obviously very important to you just to make someone happy. And it's just like, again, you have to satisfy each other. But the thing is, you can't, again, suppress completely who you are because that's that's not being true to yourself. Right. Right. So but with a synthetic, you're you're not going to have that. Mm hmm. That's fantastic. So my final question, Dave Cat, is a very lame question. But I'm going to ask it anyway. I noticed this the the first time I saw you. Your hair is fantastic. How do you get it that way? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, first of all, I get it straight every couple – thank you, first of all, I should say. Hey, no uh, problem. It looks like rubbish right now, and thankfully this is a, like, I think a three-megapixel camera, so you can't see the, the, the true horror that lies within. Um, but I, I do get it, like, flat – I flat iron it once a week, and I get it, like, professionally straightened with chemical – uh, chemicals, let's just say it, toxic chemicals. Uh, <laughs> that's the secret, huh? Toxic chemicals. Yeah, uh, toxic chemicals. And then I like have to tie it down before I go to bed. Otherwise, I wake up looking like Robert Smith. And uh, <laughs> let's just say a copious amount of gel right. also goes into the fringe, you know? So it's 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 a process that I've been doing since 1995. And it's just like I, I, I kind of don't have a choice now. But uh, it, it's, it's fun. It's fun. Mm-hmm. It is distinctive. People say, oh, it's Dave Cat. Right. You can not really see out of one eye because of the. So, so. <laughs> I'm my own pirate. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, Dave Cat, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and uh, talk to us. Yeah, no, no, th- yeah. Thanks to both of you for inviting us. Um, it, it was actually really cool. Yeah. I, uh... No, certainly, really <laughs> very enlightening, enlightening, and just a very intriguing, Dave Cat. I have to thank you again. Thank you. 
Wow. So Dave Katz. Yeah. I really, I mean, I thought it got, it got more philosophical than I was expecting, especially when Dave got, got into the, uh, the whole thing about the uncanny and souls. I think he sees his dolls as having souls. But, um, I mean, I am convinced talking to Dave Cat that he has a genuine love and care for these dolls, that they're not just sex objects to him, as a lot of people, I think, think, and, uh, and that he's normal. I, I think, I mean, all around, he's normal. But I, I think, I mean, I didn't want to, to press the point, but I feel there's something that's happened to him somewhere along the line that has made him totally disenchanted with what we call just normal romantic relationships with people in his case just with women and he just does not want to entertain the idea seriously of getting involved in that kind of relationship i mean what what do you think i mean any thoughts of like well i i think that that there must be some sort of instance where you know a, a severe burning went down that uh, sort of sparked his decision to uh, live with the doll but that being said I mean can't fault the guy I mean it does make a lot of sense it's funny I think he's actually made a believer out of me oh yeah I think I'm gonna look up the website and oh, yeah. uh, I'm gonna order myself one. a doll yeah I think so well, I mean, there's no like, complications you don't have to pay for dinner I mean it's easy it's yeah like you do save a lot of money for sure if you have a doll like that I mean I, I wanted to ask a little bit more I mean the extent to which like the dolls stay home I mean, does he ever, I mean, he told us about that time that he was in the car for the documentary and then someone came up to the car confused about what's going on in there. But I, I'd like to know, I mean, maybe if we ever talk to him again, like how much he brings the dolls out, uh, people's reaction. Um, the thing with dolls, though, is that they don't respond. I mean, they're not animated. And uh, I think that's what he wants. I think with Dave Cat is that he's trying to get to a point where he can have in his possession a doll or like some, I don't know, some kind of approximation of some kind of synthetic being that is as much as like a real woman as possible, but is not a real woman, right? So he wants to have that control. He wants to be able to at all times be in control of that situation. He wants to be able to program maybe the next evolution of the doll so it caters to his needs. Um, but I don't know. I, I feel that unless there is some kind of intervention or he has a revolution in his thinking, he will be like this forever. Probably. Yeah. And I mean, all the power to him. I don't think he's harming anybody. Right. And, uh, That's a, yeah, exactly. It's bizarre. There's no doubt about it. I mean, if I saw somebody, you know, like at a fancy restaurant for dinner with their date and it was a, you know, a synthetic, um, I'd be kind of weirded out. Yeah. Well, it's uncanny. Like he said, it's uncanny, right? I mean, especially with these real dolls. They're so convincing. Well, right? I was... It's it's funny because the the listeners can't can't see the, the the doll that we had the pleasure of just seeing on the the Skype, right? But it was kind of it's kind of scary. I swear it like its eyes were. Yeah, well, no, eventually it, it tricked me too because eventually I just began to like you know halfway through the interview I felt like there's another person here. It's like a real book, you know, and then you realize yes, that she had a presence. That's right. Uh, it was, it was a this strange. person is here, you know, and because he's telling us about the stories of this person, you know, you begin to see you're, you're projecting unconsciously these stories onto this doll and you begin to think when you're looking at this doll, you begin to think, oh, that's so and so with this past and maybe it might be like your mind. It's amazing what happens. Like your mind starts thinking like Dave Cat, you become a little bit like Dave Cat <laughs> after a while before you spend time around him. But like, as you said, like he's not harming anyone. He doesn't violate that harm principle. You know, he's, he's such a likable person, you know, he's such a likable person and he's enjoying life. I feel he's, I mean, from what we saw, you know, and talking to him, I feel maybe he's a little bit lonely, but he's genuinely happy. I, I feel like he, he has a, a level of satisfaction that would make him happy. But um, I guess I do have to wonder, like, whether in time 
you will come around, you know, you will come around to wanting something more than just a synthetic being. I don't know. It's fascinating to yeah. see. Yeah. If he does, hopefully we can get another interview with him. That's right, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to want to be here for the next cast where we interview Justin Payne, who is among a growing movement of child predator hunters. His name is actually Justin Payne. It is. It is. It's his family name. I thought it was a nickname, but it is in fact his name. That's insanity. Sounds like he was actually born to do what yes. he's doing. Well, uh, until then. This is the dark room. <laughs>